Hey, I'm so glad that you guys are here. Graffiti uh, Church and Community Ministries, just one of the places that we are supporting through the special offering this year. We have one week to go on that. Um, if you, uh, once the, the world returns to s- some kind of a semi-normal to travel again, I really encourage you um, the next time any of you are in New York City uh, to go down and to see um, the, the, the main building, what is uh, 7th Street Baptist Church, maybe, uh, in Lower Manhattan, a graffiti's original site. Sharon and I have been there. We have a friend that serves uh, on staff there. Just a tremendous ministry. It's amazing what God has done over the course of several decades through a body that is committed uh, to bringing the gospel to people through serving them uh, first. So uh, if you haven't given to the special offering, don't miss this opportunity. You have one week to go, and I would uh, especially, specifically um, encourage staff, leadership board members, committee chairs, Sunday school teachers, you guys make sure you give, right? Uh, we're going to be a church that leads uh, from the front and by example. So, um, But uh, you'll learn more about graffiti in the coming uh, months and years as well as other ministries. One of the things that we've been uh, doing throughout the last few weeks, obviously in the series, is talking about fear, uh, or rather what it's like to push through fear and to live lives that are more fueled by faith than fear. But we haven't taken a minute to just define fear. And la- language, is, language is tough because uh, words are simply vehicles that carry ideas. And sometimes our ideas are not the same. So I got curious this week at how the dictionary or, or different dictionaries would define fear. So let's look at some of the definitions. We'll start with Webster. Webster Dictionary defines fear this way, as an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. An unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by the anticipation or awareness of danger. That's Webster. Cambridge Dictionary defines fear this way. An unpleasant emotion or thought that you have when you are frightened or worried by something dangerous, painful, or bad that is happening or might happen. Or might happen. I had a, um, a, a flu test about a year and a half ago, had a lot of flu-like symptoms. And when, when they, they came in, the nurse brought in a Q-tip the size of a yardstick. And I remember thinking as we were going through this process, why can't we come up with a simpler way to test for flu? Right? If we can land people on the moon when we decide, you'd think we could test for flu easier. Now, I didn't show any fear because that would have been unmanly. So I just let her shove that thing up into my brain. Any of you that have had COVID tests or, or you pitiful creatures that work in a, a job where you have to regularly be tested, you're probably over the flu test by now. But uh, I found that very unpleasant uh, and don't want to do it again. So um, dictionary.com is actually my favorite definition for fear. Dictionary.com uh, describes fear as a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, pain, etc. I like the etc. because it just says, or anything else. right? Anything else that may bring these emotions. Now, listen to this. Whether the threat is real or imagined, whether it's real or imagined, the feeling or condition of being afraid. Now, can we, because this is a safe place, and more, uh, more and more and more, month by month and year by year, we're going to get freer uh, in here. But can we just, uh, with a measure of honesty, uh, do a show of hands on this one? How many of you ha- have worried and, and feared yourself, that's not actually a correct use of grammar, but worried or feared yourself nearly into sickness over something that never came to pass, that in the end was an imaginary fear or, or worry? Yeah, that's almost unanimous. That's almost unanimous. Fear has this, has this powerful grasp on us. We're going to take a look at one of the areas where God addresses fear in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 41 this morning. If you've got your Bibles with you or maybe you've got uh, uh, the Bible on your mobile device, go ahead and find Isaiah 41. One of the things that's interesting is um, the Bible uh, has do not fear do not be afraid, fear not, or derivatives thereof, over 360 times in Scripture. It is the most prominent command given in the Bible. 
more than we're commanded to do anything else, we are commanded not to be afraid. And if any of us pretends to, to puff out our chest and put on this front, like we're never afraid, we never experience fear, we're living a lie. Uh, I know when our uh, oldest son, Cade, was, was very, very young. In fact, he'd, he had never rolled over before. That's how young he was, just a baby. He rolled over one day for the first time and rolled himself off a changing table uh, onto the floor of our house. Uh, Sharon was at home. She called me. I was at work uh, serving a ch- uh, church in North Dallas. And she said, hey, a lot of emotion behind there. Hey, Kate just rolled off the changing floor um, and landed, uh, or uh, rolled off the changing table, landed on the floor. Um, She was distraught, and I said, do you want me to come home? And she said, what can you do? And I'm like, well, why did you call? Some some of you who are married know how fast that stuff can escalate, right? Um, A word here, a word there, and then before long, it's like the shuttle has taken off. And you don't know. So don't, don't bother me. So she came up early. I saw one of the nurses that uh, served regularly at, at church, pediatric nurse, said, he looks good. Kids are so strong, resilient. Wasn't a wooden floor um, or tile. So he's probably fine. Well, that afternoon when he woke up from nap, he, he had a, a lump coming out of his head that looked like you'd cut a, uh, a tennis ball in half and inserted it under his scalp. And so our friend, the pediatric nurse, said, now take him in. Right, So we took him in, and he actually had a skull fracture. He had a fractured skull. Uh, they were going to transport him to Children's Hospital in Dallas. Um, and I, I remember just being o- overcome with fear and emotion that, that our, our little infant son actually had a, a fracture in his skull. All the way to Children's, we were, we were driving to the hospital. And then, then you get the weight, you know, because there are more important things to deal with in front of you. Uh, at the ER, eventually you get in there, get back, and Kate is fine now. Most sometimes we wonder, but most of the time we think, and doctors tell us he's he's just fine. But I I've known fear. Uh, a year ago, this last September, I'd been struggling with something all summer, wrestling, and I'm sitting in a doctoral seminar at Baylor, and and God just speaks to me there, and He says, "Hey, um, this this wrestling thing that you've had has has been has been me, and I want you to prepare to take your hands off the church that you're." currently leading um, and began to prayerfully engage me and be open to me moving you somewhere else. And I began to think about the reality of that, leaving a church where I was known, respected, loved, and trusted. I'm um, leaving a church that we had uh, poured our, our life into for six or seven years, seeing God start from nothing and through conversion growth, grow it to, to several hundred in attendance over a couple of different services with a staff that we'd worked so hard to see God develop. Our kids were rooted there with friends and in school and beginning to, to wrestle with God and say, look, we're, we're not unfamiliar with moving, but what's it going to be like? You, you begin to fear uh, for your kids. How are they going to take this move? You be, begin to fear as you pray about the next place that you don't know. What's that going to be like? All of us live with fear. We all struggle with fear at time. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 41. And I just want to remind you, we're going to pick it up in verse 8 in just a minute. I want to remind you that the people of God are in exile at this time, and everything that they thought was true about God, they're unsure of now. And sometimes you have tragedy strike your life in a way that shakes the foundation of faith that you thought you had. And you wonder about the goodness of God. And you wonder if God is who you thought He was and if He is who he says he is, and this is where they were. Isaiah 41, beginning with verse 8. But you, you Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. Now I want to pause here and just remind you, in case some of you are thinking, well, uh, God's talking to, to Israel here, but he's not talking to you or to us this morning. I would have you go back and reread Romans chapter 2 and chapter 3. I would have you go back and reread Galatians, particularly Galatians 3, 7, where God declares through the Apostle Paul that all those who live by faith are actually children of Abraham, that Abraham was never the point. Abraham was a a vehicle, vehicle. he was a a conduit 
to bring the ultimate will and purpose and plan of God to the world through Jesus Christ. But don't miss this here because we see it over and over throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. God says to us this morning, I've chosen you. You didn't choose me. You may have said yes. You said that on the other side of my pursuit of your heart and your life through the Holy Spirit. I have chosen you. Verse 9, I took you from the ends of the earth. From the farthest corners, I called you. Some of you who came to faith as adults, this would be your testimony. I had lunch with a guy some weeks back who came to faith as an adult. And he said, when, when I had a, a transforming encounter with Jesus Christ, when I came to faith in Jesus Christ, my life was messed up in every way it could be messed up. That's a picture of someone that God has, has brought back from the ends of the earth, from the farthest corners. He says, I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you, and I have not rejected you. That, that addition right there at the end, I have chosen you and I have not rejected you, is not just Hebrew repetition. It is Hebrew repetition, right? Because they, they couldn't push command whatever, and italicize or bold or underline. But it is a reminder to us, to human beings who felt the sting of rejection. There are few things that we encounter in life, truthfully, that hurt as much as the sting of rejection does. Sometimes it can wound us so deeply that it affects the way that we interact with people for years later. I remember serving on staff at a large church once. Um, the senior pastor chose for whatever reason really to, to remain emotionally disengaged from the staff. Didn't really engage with us, didn't really know us. Even staff who'd been there eight, nine, ten years Full time, And I remember just kind of as I observed this, especially early on as a new staff member, it was, it was really curious to me. Um, having pastored for years and years now, I think I can probably guess what happened. At, at some point in that senior pastor's past, he uh, was or felt like he was ramrodded or, or kind of shot in the back by staff. Right? And he felt the, the sting of betrayal and the sting of rejection and had said either consciously or subconsciously, emotionally, I will protect myself from that ever happening again. I will keep a significant emotional a distance from those I most directly lead. And that used to be leadership philosophy. I think that's garbage. I think the best way to lead is through friendship. It makes it harder sometimes. But I think, I think that's the way God intends it to lead. But the sting of rejection is something all of us have felt. And if you haven't felt it yet, man, just push into God because your time's coming. Right? You're just not old enough yet. But you'll feel it. God will walk you through it. Now look at verse 10. So, 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 in light of the fact that I've chosen you, in light of the fact that I've gathered you to myself through no effort and no desire of your own, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. Let's pause for just a second. We, we dealt with, uh, we're in 10A, we'll do 10B in a minute. But God says, in light of the fact that I've called you, that I've chosen you, that I've made you mine, that you're secure in me, he says, do not fear. And then he just gives us a little bit extra. He says, do not fear, for I am with you. He doesn't say, do not fear, you are awesome. He doesn't say, do not fear, you are strong. You've been taking creatine supplements. You started CrossFit. He doesn't say, do not fear, because you're, you're getting ready to live your best life now. He says, you do not fear, because I am. Am with you. Friends, when the storm rages in your life, the only sure foundation you have is Jesus Christ. It's not your greatness, it's not your education, it's not how much spinach or berries you eat. It's the person and power of God given to you through Jesus Christ. 
He says, do not be dismayed. Dismayed is fear run amok in our lives. Right? Sometimes you're a little fear. Any of you ever lay your head down to go to sleep at night? Um, any of you, are, are, are you just active thinkers when your head hits the pillow? I'm a super active thinker when my head hits the pillow. My head hits the pillow and all of a sudden everything that I could have accomplished in the last day or that day or the week before or over the last year suddenly burst into my mind. Everything I'm not that I thought I would be, every way that I disappointed Sharon if I stay awake long enough that day comes to mind, right? And, and have you ever noticed that sometimes in the quiet, still hours at night, fear gets a hold of you and sort of begins to have its way with you. Anybody been there? And all of a sudden, you're not just afraid, you're dismayed. You're dismayed. You've got to get up. And sometimes I have to get up and think, you know what would solve this? A peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? And a couple of episodes of Last Man Standing or The Office, and I'll be just fine. And God says, God says, no, that's going to give you indigestion. And you'll probably fall asleep in the chair and at your age wake up with your shoulder hurting. God says, no, come to me. Come to me. He says, do not fear because I am with you. He says, do not be dismayed. He doesn't say, do not, do not be dismayed because you can do some yoga and work this out. Because you can walk the block. He says, do not be dismayed for I am your God. I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. Who's going to strengthen you and help you? God is. God is. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This is, this is the picture of, of being anchored, being tethered to something by such a powerful rope that nothing can break it. That it's impossible for, for your weight or for the weight of anything pressing down on you to cause this anchor, this, this rope to break and for you to fall and be lost. He says, I will strengthen and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What he's saying here is that I alone am sovereign. This morning you need to hear that God alone is sovereign. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't require anything. He is self-sustaining, self-glorifying, all in all. He is the Alpha and Omega. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is sovereign. He alone is the author and sustainer of all that is. Of all that is. Whatever needs you may have this morning... Supplying that need is nothing for God. It's nothing for Him. He owns all that is. God alone speaks things into existence through the power of His Word. When's the last time you did that? When's the last time you said, let there be a cheeseburger? And there was. Right? Sometimes I can't even pull that off with my kids. Children, let there be a sandwich on Father's plate. They're like, what? You know, they don't get the cues. So I have to say, would you make me a sandwich? Right? We don't have the power that God does. But God not only says, I have all power. I alone am sovereign. He says, I'm able and willing, even desirous uh, to remain in covenant union with you. I have you. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. But the question comes, why is it? Why is it that Scripture needs to give us 360 plus commands to not fear, to not be afraid, to not be dismayed? Why is it that we are so prone to fear? And not the healthy kind of fear like we've talked about over and over that says don't jump off a second or third story building because you can't fly. But the kind of spirit of fear that we're prone to living with, that 2 Timothy 1.7 says, does not come from God. That's not a spirit that God's given us. Now, I, just, I, need, I need you to hear this even if it stings, right? Because I think the answer to this question, honestly, is that behind most, not all, 
But behind most of the fear and the anxiety that we live with is the truth that we simply don't trust that God is good. Let me make it personal and directive. Behind most of the fear and the anxiety that you live with is a failure to believe truly in the depths of your being that God is good. It's a failure to trust that God really, truly is good. And I would just encourage you, don't lie about that. Confess it to God. Bring it to God and say, I struggle. God, I struggle to believe, really, that you are God. And where, wherever you have grown up, maybe if you've grown up in church or, or wherever geographically you're from, uh, this, this may be different. But for a lot of us who grew up in the, in the Bible Belt, there is, and I hear it over and over, and I feel it crop up in my own heart sometimes, there is at our core a struggle to believe that God truly is is good that his posture toward us in Christ not because of who we are but because of who Christ is and the fact that we are covered by his righteousness and his grace that his posture toward us is one of delight one of delight and I'll just tell you this that most of the mean men that you've encountered and sometimes it's women but usually it's men most of the mean men that you've encountered in church Behind the destructive drive to, to dominate, to pursue power, to control what people believe and, and what the church does and the direction of it and how it operates is a heart that has never really understood the lavish love and grace of God. That has never really been wrapped up in and set free by the love and the grace of God who's still living in some form of, of obedience to rules, believing that God's primary posture toward them is anger, though he's willing to be gracious. And I would just tell you that Genesis through Revelation says that's wrong. That's actually backwards. That God's posture toward us in Christ is love. He's willing to discipline. He's willing to bring us through seasons of training that are going to sting a bit. But I will just tell you, and I would encourage you to ask yourself this. Do you really believe that God is good? Because I think so many of us struggle with this. We don't come across like we do, but we do. And it shows up in fear and anxiety and anger and meanness and legalism and judgmentalness. Let's, uh, let's look at Romans chapter 8, first two verses real quick. Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, therefore, in light of what Christ has done, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, he doesn't say there has never been any condemnation, does he? Because you and I, outside of Christ, stand underneath the condemnation of God, and rightly so. But Paul says, in light of what Christ has done, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How much condemnation for those in Christ Jesus? None. And friends, I don't think we really believe that. I think so often we drive around during our days thinking we're just one wrong decision away, one bad word away from God's condemnation being poured out on us. And I will just tell you, church, God's condemnation in its fullness was poured out on Jesus Christ on the cross. And Christ absorbed it. That you and I and all who would place our faith in him and say yes to him might be set free. Verse 2. There's now no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free. The law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Maybe you're saying, hey, Matt, I'm not exactly sure I know what that means. That's all right. We're not going to explain it this morning. But dwell with those two verses. Read them over and over. Read them prayerfully. Uh, prayerfully. Read the context around it. But hear God say to you this morning, if you're in Christ, there's, there's no condemnation left for you. You are free. 
free to sin? Absolutely. Is that beneficial to you? Not at all. It'll wreck your life. It'll wreck your relationships. But you're free in Christ Jesus. Let's go, um, let's do Galatians. Or let's do Colossians. Colossians, I'm sorry. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, um, 13 through 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. Again, who's the active agent here? God is. When we were dead in our sins, God made us alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. How many of our sins? All our sins. And church, this is past, present, and future. You've heard me say this, but I could never say it enough. It has to be that way. It has to be that way. Because how many of your sins were future sins when Christ was crucified on the cross? All of them. Christ has already paid the price. He's paid for what you said this morning. He's paid for what you're going to do this afternoon. He's paid for how you're going to fall short this week and next year. He's paid it all. He forgave us all our sins, verse 14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, having wiped clean the slate of death that you owed God, which stood against us and condemned us. Now, if he's canceled the charge of your legal indebtedness, which stood against you and condemned you, and he's taken it away and nailed it to the cross, how much condemnation is left for you? None. 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 Verse 15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I got so fired up thinking about this this week that I was afraid I would go into an entire message out of these verses. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to move on. But I would say to you, if you know that you struggle with this issue of understanding God's goodness and your freedom in him through Jesus Christ, You need to be drinking in Romans 8, 1 and 2. You need to be drinking in Colossians 2, 13, 14, and 15. You need to understand what has happened by God's grace in Christ on your behalf. Uh, Some weeks ago, the uh, college and career small group meets on Thursday night, they decided to go through the book of Ecclesiastes. Brandon Wilson, who's been leading them, I gave a hard time. I was like, man, why don't you pick something more chipper like Lamentations, right? You're in a pandemic and you pick Ecclesiastes, but I think it's been a good study for them. But I will tell you, Lamentations is a great book. Part of what is so deeply unsettled and fractured the church through COVID is that we don't know how to lament. We don't have the ability to express, to express grief in ways that doesn't undo us, that still glorifies and honors God and brings alongside us brothers and sisters in Christ so that we might give language to what we're feeling so deeply inside, but God has given the gift of lament so that we can go through seasons of grief and loss. Look at Lamentations, verses 22, or I'm sorry, chapter 3. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Because of the Lord's great love, We are not consumed. Now, let's do this again. Because of the Lord's great what? Love. He doesn't even say because of the Lord's great patience, though. God knows he's got it. Anybody grateful for that this morning? Yeah. He's got great patience. He's got great endurance. He's got great mercy. He's got great grace. But the author of Lamentations, Lamentations says that it's because of his great love that you and I are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. This is the author of Lamentations saying what God said through Isaiah. He is able. Whatever fear shakes you this morning, whatever fear is whispering to you that you're not enough, that you can't do this, that because of this, that, or the other, you'll never become what God intends, that this may happen with your kids, that this may happen with your parents, that this may happen in your marriage. Whatever it is, God is able. Verse 23, they are new every morning. God's compassions continue to be poured out for you day after day after day after day. Great is your faithfulness. 
Let's read it again straight through. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Charles Spurgeon, that greatest of preachers, said this around the subject of fear. He said, now, and I didn't clean this up from the English because I, I think it will be helpful for us. Now I, gather, now I gather from the plentifulness of fear nots, even in the Old Testament, that the Lord does not wish his people to be afraid. That he is glad to see his people full of courage. And especially that he does not love them to be afraid of him. He would have his children treat him with confidence. Slavish fear may be thought to be congenial to the Old Testament. And yet it is not so. For the Lord cries to his chosen, fear not. Yes, he does. Over 360 times. Do not be afraid. Spurgeon does something here. He, co he contrasts living with a slavish fear with living with courage. Joshua 1 9, a verse that many of you probably memorized early on in your walk with Christ. God is speaking to Joshua as he's taking over the people of God as Moses' successor and beginning to uh, prepare to move into the promised land, the land of Canaan. He says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Not because you're awesome, but because God has covenanted himself with you. He is united himself with you. For New Testament believers, it's even stronger. We are in Christ. And lest we think this is just a promise, I'm very careful not to rip out promises from the Old Testament that were one and done kind of promises and make them universal. Lest we think this is not universal. Look at Deuteronomy 31. Look at Hebrews 13, 5. God continues to say, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Right? Your friends may... Your parents may, your spouse may even leave you or forsake you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Church, we are called to live with courage. Rather than fear, God delights in us as his children living with faith-fueled courage. That says, man, I have courage not because of who I am, but because of whose I am. Because my God says he will never leave me. Because my God says do not be afraid, I am your God. I am with you. I will make a way. I am able. And I'll just say that courage is not the absence of fear. It's the willingness, the decision to push on through and do the right thing in spite of fear. Courage is a decision, not an emotion. Some of the greatest acts in human history, humanly speaking, have done by people filled with fear but willing and committed to pushing through it in the exercise of courage, it is the decision to, regardless of fear, do the right thing at the right time in the right way. Isn't that last one the hardest sometimes? To do the right thing at the right time in the right way. I can usually go in for the first two. I want to do the right thing at the right time, but I prefer most of the time to do it my way. And God says, no, 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 Jeffries, you do it my way. You do the right thing at the right time, and you do it the right way, which is my way. And I would just say this to you as, as Tori and John come and they prepare um, to lead us as we respond to God's word, that most of the time, I'll just be honest, most of the time what Jesus asks you to do when he's operative in you and the spirit speaking, most of the time what Jesus asks you to do is going to elicit a little bit of fear in you. The first human response is going to be, I don't think I can do that. It's going to generate a fear or a sense of fear and inadequacy in you. But you're called to push through that and do it anyway. You never know what God may cause to unfold through a simple act of obedience. Through you saying, yes, I'll say these words. I'll take this chance. I'll give this 
money. I'll serve in this way. I'll minister to these people. You don't have to understand completely to obey them immediately. It, it, let, me, let, me, let me just do a show of hands. How many of you have kids in here? Little, grown, whatever. Okay, a lot of kids in here. Uh, did, did you ever find yourself telling your kids or wanting to say d- delayed obedience is disobedience? <laughs> so it is true spiritually. Did you ever find yourself wanting to say you don't have to understand it, just do it? Right? It's the same in our relationship with God. You don't have to understand completely to obey immediately. That's what faith is, friends. It's saying, you got it, God. You're God and I'm not and you will not leave me. My hope, my prayer for us this morning, my prayer for you, whether you're in this room or you're watching online, is that you may, as the Apostle Paul said, by the power of God know how wide and how long and how deep and how high is the love of God for you in Christ Jesus. Because, church, when you begin to experience that, you begin to be set free. You begin to be free to love and to take chances and to do in ways that fear will always prevent you from as long as you feel like God's angry at you. Let's stand and pray. God, we can gather from Paul's prayer for the Ephesians nearly 2,000 years ago that we have difficulty as human beings understanding the depth and the breadth of your love for us in Christ Jesus. Lord, we don't experience love like that on earth. But God, together this morning is the church we can, by your Spirit, by your sanctifying work in our lives, together as your people reflect this kind of love to a broken and hurting world around us. Set us free this morning, God, wherever we are. I pray that as we sing in response to you, God, that each individual in this room would release to you that fear, that anxiety that's whispering to them this morning. God, may it be done in and through Jesus Christ.